gathering future driving industries to lead innovation. DGFEZ consists of the IT convergence industry, the core of the fourth industrial revolution, the advanced medical industry, the industry that will realize the dream of life extension, the advanced transport and machinery component industry, the base of all industries, the energy industry for the future of a sustainable planet. We have determined four industrial sectors with the largest growth potential in terms of future global industry as key industries and chosen eight business districts in major areas of Tegu Gyeongbu. Among them, the development of four districts have already been completed, and excellent businesses from Korea and overseas have moved in, and they are actively conducting businesses. The remaining four districts are working very hard in developing infrastructure in order to have a perfect business environment. Home to Korea's best companies such as Samsung, LG, and POSCO, where some 500 foreign companies are congregated. Daegu Gyeongbuk is a popular city among businesses. It has 51 colleges which foster quality workforce. In Korea's largest cluster of R&D institutes, DG Fez's businesses will have better opportunities for innovative growth thanks to the network of world-class research facilities. DG Fez's path is widely open to the world. Three international airports, seven harbors, eight expressways, 100 operations of KTX trains per day. Thanks to the various traffic networks, DG Fez is quickly connected with neighboring cities and world-class companies. In addition, DG Fez will become a new growth base that integrates logistics, tourism, and high-tech industries through the construction of a 15.3 million square meter new integrated airport. Korea, a country loved by people across the world. Daegu Gyeongbuk, with its beautiful nature, is a place filled with Korea's rich history and culture and UNESCO World Heritage Sites. A place full of excitement thanks to the various cultural festivals held every year. A global city where world-famous scholars gather to discuss the present and future of our global village. A convenient and pleasant residential environment featuring leisure and cultural facilities for a better quality of life, advanced medical facilities, and even international schools for expatriates. DG Fez is equipped with the best settlement environment for businesses. DG Fez provides systematic support for the settlement and sustainable growth of its businesses. Business customized one-to-one one-stop services business matchmaking services that maximize the synergy of businesses. DG Fez provides various incentives that strengthen business management. The future is for people who are prepared. A place where innovative growth can be achieved through knowledge-based industries. Come to our global innovation growth base. Tegu Kyungbu Free Economic Zone. Good morning, I'm Yoon Mio, Project Manager of Tegu Kyungbu Free Economic Zone. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to speak to you about business environment of Tegu Kyungbu Free Economic Zone. Today, I will uh, like to share the, a quick overview of DGFS and support policies for IT and software industry and incentives and benefits that DGFS is providing for invest, uh, foreign invested companies. Before I talk about DGFS, I'd like to let you know what is a free economic zone. Free economic zones are specially designated areas uh, by the Korean central government to improve the business and living environment for foreign invested firms in Korea. Here, foreign invested companies are provided with various incentives such as tax exemption, cash grant, and relaxed regulations. Currently, there are nine phases in Korea, including Daegu Gyeongbuk, 
in Chan and Busan Jinhe. And the, this slide shows uh, Daegu Gyeongbu Free Economic Zones eight districts. We have a total of eight free economic zones in Daegu Gyeongbu, and uh, our target industries are IT convergence, high tech medicine, and high tech auto parts and machinery. So these eight districts are focusing on developing and fostering these industries uh, with foreign investing companies. And today, I would like to focus on Susang Alpha City, which is designed to uh, develop and foster IT and software industry within Daegu. Uh, the first strength of DigiFaz is outstanding accessibility. Um, this, uh, this is the overview of Daegu Gyeongbuk on the area of 19,909 square kilometers. We have population over 5 million, and these are the numbers of GRDP and export. And as you can see this map, Daegu Gyeongbuk is located in the southeastern part of Korea. And we have eight highways and um, uh, by the KTX high-speed transit, trans, uh, it's a train. Uh, it takes 99 minutes from Seoul to Daegu. And we also have uh, two international airports nearby, Daegu International Airport and Incheon and Kime International Airport, actually three airports. And also by 2028, there will be a new Daegu Gyeongbu International Airport. So DigiFest provides easy access to the world cities with a population over 1 million within a four hour flight. And also by 2028, we can more easily uh, reach to the cities in North America and European countries. And second strength of DigiFaz is outstanding human resources. Uh, we have a diverse talent pool with the right expertise. The industries that we are focusing on are highly value added and they require skilled labor. To provide the workforce in Daegu Gyeongbuk, we have 51 universities and colleges. Among them, uh, Digi Digist, uh, Daegu Gyeongbu Institute of Science and Technology is specialized in robot and IT, and Gyeongbu National University in electronics, and Yongnam University in machinery, and Postec in new materials and biology. These universities produce 70,000 graduates annually. And this uh, slide shows abundant research and development infrastructure. In Daegu Gyeongbuk, we have about 50 remarkable research and uh, development infrastructure for IT, software, pharmaceutical, bio, and material industry. And today, I will, uh, as I mentioned, I will focus on IT and software. So we have Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute, Mobile Convergence Technology Center and Daegu Digital Industry Promotion Agency and so on. And I will explain uh, about these R&D function in more detail later. And I'd like to explain the uh, what we what support we are providing for IT and software industry. Daegu Gyeongbuk area is well known for world leading IT software, mobile, and robot cluster. Uh, the major companies, including Samsung, LG, and Dassault System, Hyundai Robotics, Siemens within Daegu Gyeongbuk represent a well balanced mix of core IT sectors such as mobile, display, embedded software, and intelligent robots. And these companies and R&D centers offer various opportunities for foreign investment companies and local companies to collaborate and bear fruits. Centered in Daegu, the IT cluster encompasses a number of cities in Gyeongbuk province, such as Gumi, Pohang, and Gyeongju. And ICT research is carried out at DG's 
and POSTEC, as well as many government-supported research and development laboratories. And this is Susang Alpha City. As I mentioned, uh, within DGFES, uh, we have eight districts, and this is one of the uh, districts. And uh, Susang Alpha City is located in the center of Daegu, and its uh, area is about 576,000 square meters. And the construction was finished in 2019. And its target industry is IT software and knowledge-based service industries. And the land cost is about five, not, 945 US dollars per square meter. Uh, the key facilities uh, include uh, Software Convergence Technology Support Center in Susan Alpha City. And also residents can enjoy various features such as Daegu Art Museum, Daegu Baseball Stadium, and Daegu Indoor Athletic Stadium. So this is the land development plan. Um, these light sky colored areas are allocated for IT and software. You can see Knowledge Industry Center and Software Convergence Technology Support Center. And the remaining land for the IT and software is 33,557 square meters. And the land price is approximately 945 US dollars per square meters. Here, uh, investors can make direct investment uh, by establishing a research and development center, or they can make equity investment in promising IT and software local uh, businesses. So DigiFest uh, is providing matchmaking services. Uh, we can introduce uh, promising local uh, companies uh, if the investor wants to uh, make connection with local companies to make equity investment. Susan Alpha City is also a smart city test bed. Here, uh, uh, companies can uh, take carry out various tests. Uh, we Susan Alpha City is supporting the development of smart city related new products technologies and services, and nurturing human resources. It is a city where smart technology is applied to various fields, such as transportation, energy, crime prevention, and safety. As Susan Alpha City is equipped with autonomous vehicle demonstration roads and unmanned parking control systems, companies can utilize these infrastructure as testbed And Susan Alpha City is also a software convergence cluster. It is the largest cluster of software developers outside the Seoul metropolitan area. It is equipped with six support institutions, including Daegu Digital Industry Promotion Agency, uh, uh, DIP. DIP is providing various support for overseas marketing and uh, software development and human resources development. And Software Convergence Technology Support Center, uh, this is uh, providing support for software design and testing and certification and consulting. And also we have Software Convergence Tech B Center and National Emergency Network Center. And we, uh, Susan Alpha City has 150 of 40 enterprises and 4,000 permanent workers are working in that cluster. And uh, also we have, in Daegu Gyeongbuk, we have Electronics and Telecommunications Research Institute, uh, which uh, can facilitate companies to develop ICT convergence technologies and commercialize their technologies in automobile, medical, and mobile industries, and also mobile convergence technology center. And these are the support programs for IT and software industry. Uh, companies within Susan Alpha City 
they can get uh, R&D support and overseas marketing and human resources development. For research and development, uh, these are the examples of uh, the projects, 5G-based AR, MR content, technology development and demo projects have been carried out and applied AI technology support for local industries. These are the examples of R&D uh, projects. And for overseas marketing, hidden champion companies can get support when they attend the CES and US public procurement programs. And they can also uh, participate in uh, joint overseas expansion programs through ODA programs. And for human resources development, for AI and software talent development, for core human resources in the fields of AI, blockchain, cloud computing, big data, VA, VR, AR, to meet the demands from digital transformation. Uh, so some of our city companies can uh, get benefits and support for all these um, R&D and support marketing and human resource development support. And this is the list of IT and software conversions companies within Suzong Alpha City and in Daegu. Uh, we have lots of uh, various online games and cloud system and logic, uh, automotive electronic software, embedded software companies. And you can see their sales are gradually growing. And these companies are uh, taking advantage of the uh, strength uh, that is provided by the Suzong Alpha City and various research and development institutes and organizations. And lastly, I'd like to share the incentives and benefits of the DGFAS. For uh, foreign investors, we uh, are providing local industry information. And uh, when they want to make equity investment, we are identifying their partners for uh, joint venture and their potential par business partners. And for company setup, we uh, facilitate them to uh, get their company registered. And pro we provide office space prior to establishment. And we facilitate uh, companies for in investors to access to funding. and. Uh, intellectual property rights registration and certification of products. For after-service program, uh, when the foreign investing companies face difficulties in terms of taxes or intellectual property rights or any other like business uh, difficulties, you know, we can um, solve their problems as we have ombudsman program and we are also uh, we support business matchmaking services and these are the key investment incentives uh, for the foreign investor foreign companies investing more than 1 million US dollars and hire 10 uh, full-time researchers we provide tariff exemption 100 percent for up to five years and acquisition and property tax exemption for 100% up to 15 years. And based on the investment amount and the types of technology that the foreign investing company could bring into the DGFAS, they can get cash grant to finance construction of facilities or equipment purchasing. So if you are interested in investing in Suzong Alpha City and DGFS, please just do not hesitate to contact me. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I am Dr. Erkan Bil from Turkey. I'm representing Çanakkale Technology Development Zone and currently I am the Chief Executive Officer and Member of Board of Çanakkale Technopark. Now I am addressing you from the city of Çanakkale, one of the most beautiful cities in the world. On that point, I would like to inform you about our beloved city Çanakkale. There are two cities that connect two con continents in the world, 
and both are in Turkey. One of them is in Istanbul, one of the largest city in the world, all you know, which has over 15 million population. And the other city is Çanakkale that I'm presenting you right now. Let's start our presentation and welcome our presentation again. Uh, just a second, please. As you all know, research and development infrastructures are very crucial parts of startup ecosystems. Today, I will talk about the current stage of the global startups ecosystem and look over the main features and important indicators. Afterwards, I will give an overview of Turkey and talk about Çanakkale and Çanakkale Technopart. And the last part of the presentation, I will talk about our new project and ongoing projects. Just a second, please. First of all, I would like to mention the ranking of the startup ecosystem worldwide, worldwide on the base of countries. As you see in the presentation, uh, there is a report prepared by Startup Link. There are some certain factors that determine the ranking of countries and cities. Each location has a total score which is some of three scores measuring quantity, quality and business environment. Some of the elements taken into account when calculating these scores are the number of startups, number of co-working space, the size of investment received by the startups, the number of employees per startup, technological infra infrastructures and so on. Turkey so an increase of five spots in 2021 and now ranks 44th globally, as you see, as I mentioned in the presentation. This represents the biggest increase among countries in the Eastern Europe region, where 18th of the 23 ranked countries have experienced a decrease in ranking this year. Secondly, when we look up at the top ecosystem rankings according to the report prepared by Startup Chrome, the top five glo global startup ecosystems remain the same, although with some movement within them. You see on the table, Silicon Valley maintains its first uh, position. New York remains at second, although now London is up and tied with it. Beijing is at fourth and Boston is at fifth position. Here too, there are ranking factors that determine the ranking, which are performance, funding, connectedness, market reach, knowledge, talent, like that. Some of the ranking factors taken into account are ecosystem value, exists, you, as you know, startup success, quality and activity, and also local connectedness in infrastructure, research and patterns. The effect rate of each factor varies as a percentage. Talent is 20% on this percentage, if, if I say about the percentages. Performance is 30%, market reach is 15%, Funding is 25% and connectedness and knowledge is 5%. In addition to overview of the best startup ecosystems, it's also very important to analyze emerging startup ecosystems. The top 10 emerging ecosystems are in order, if we ordered all them, okay, as you see on the table. Uh, Mumbai, Jakarta, Zurich, Greater, Helsinki, uh, Guanzo, Barcelona, Madrid, Philadelphia, 
uh, like that. It's going on like that, okay? And uh, Istanbul is in 16th place. When we focus especially on the Asia Pacific region, we can see that the number of emerging startup ecosystems in the top 20 has reached sixth. The factors evaluated while determining the ranking of top emerging ecosystems vary. Only focusing on the performance, funding, market reach, and talent. Talent affect 10%, performance 45%, market reach 15%, and funding 35, 30%, I'm sorry. As these ecosystems expand and start up complete globally, ecosystem builders will have to play an important role in for, forging in the paths ahead. These growing ecosystems can learn from leader startup ecosystems to leverage their strengths and accordingly focus their efforts and sources. Moving on to examining Turkey's place in this ecosystem, I would like first to talk about a general situation. Turkey is well positioned, attractive hub, only three hours by flight away from the most important cities in Europe and many key cities in Asia. Turkey had an official population of 83 million in 2020, which half of that population under the age of 32, giving the country the largest youth population in the EU era. Turkey is currently the 19th largest economy in the world and the average annual GDP growth rate of the 5.5% between 2003 and 2019. Turkey also plays the seventh among the top 34 upper middle income economies in the Global Innovation Index 2019 with human capital and research and creative outputs as the top straight characteristics of the country. Turkey's entrepreneurial ecosystem has seen unprecedented level of ex investment activity in 2020, with a total of $143 million raised, that is a 35% increase over 2019, by 155 startups from various angels and VCs. What was most noteworthy about the investment and startup ecosystem in Turkey in 2020 was the level of later VC stage funding. These are series C and later, reaching the all-time high at $42 million. That, uh, as we can say, $7 million in 2019, $15 million in 2000 and 2018. This situation gives entrepreneurs the hope that the ecosystem is reaching a certain level of maturity, but it remains to be seen whether the growth countries in the coming years. The large share of domestic VC investment is still directed at seed and early stage companies. The current trends show that Turkish startup raise late stage capital primary from global investors. For example, Getir, maybe you know, Getir raised $38 million, $25 million, of which came from a Silicon Valley investor, Michael Moritz. Key verticals that attracted the most amount of investment in 2020 were gaming, retail tech, and fintech. While in terms of the number of deals, SaaS led the way, followed by fintech and health tech. That said, both 2019 and 2020 saw the rise of gaming startups con constituting the largest share of new startups and emerging in the past two years, potentially influenced by notable exist in the space. In 2020, we also observed no relation between the investment and exit patterns and the macroeconomic movements in Turkey. In 2020, 
despite the continuing macroeconomic instability, uh, instability, instability uh, all over the world, economy, not to mention the outbreak of the global pandemic early in the year, Turkey had its first unicorn exit with Zynga purchasing peak games at $1.8 $1 billion. It was also Europe's largest VC-backed exit in 2020. It is very important. In the table, you can see the best startup deals of 2020. You can see the first on the first stage peak, gaming, Zynga, and the Rolex gaming in Zynga from uh, the investors origins, uh, origins from USA. And we sense, uh, you know, uh, also investors origin Turkey. I should also mention the stakeholders that have had an impact on Turkey's high speed growth in the startup ecosystem in recent years. Uh, for about accelerators, period to 2010, there were only six active startup accelerator program in Turkey. By the end of 2019, this number had reached 50, 57 and eightfold increase in the nine years. Given the pop popularity of fintech in Turkey, eight banks launched fintech focused accelerator programs in the past period. Also, 15 technoparks started new accelerator programs both locally and internationally. On the other hand, if you look at the co working spaces, co working spaces have become the heap working and gathering hub for entrepreneurs and freelancers alike in the recent years. While the co-working space model first emerged in, the, in Turkey in the early 2010s, the concept only began to gain popularity in 2015 when a handful of successful examples demonstrated the economic viability of the concept, emboldening copycats to quickly diversify and multiply available to co-working co spaces across the ecosystem. By the end of 2019, the total number of co-working spaces in Turkey had reached 44, with over 5,000 startups, scale-ups, and freelancers renting space in these communities. For about government, the Turkish government is very active and strong supporter of the startup ecosystem in Turkey, offering a variety of programs and policies to enable the establishment or growth of startups. You can see a few of government's key entrepreneurial policies as follows. Startup support organization programs, funding access to capital, etc. And startup friendly corporations. Private corporations have become active players in the startup ecosystem, organizing and sponsoring a variety of events, contents, and accelerators to support the formation and growth of local startups. Specifically, Leading Turkish banks have launched both accelerator programs and venture capital funds to reach the reach and start uh, support startups while leverage ne leveraging networks resources to scale their growth. Just in the last five years, eight accelerator programs and four corporate venture capital funds have been established by Turkish banks. In 2010, there were only two corporate venture entities Specifically, spe specifically established to invest in early stage startups. In 2010, also very important, uh, very important year for us. By the end 2019, this figure has ballooned by 26. Thanks to the relaxation of regulation and availability of incentives designed to encourage private corporations to establish established CVC funds. In 2019, 30 private companies also made direct investment into startups without, without a separate CVC entity. Let's talk about Technoparks. The establishment of Technoparks in Turkey started in 2001 and now has reached 61 technological parks across the country at the end of 2019. And Technoparks, 
technoparks, more than 5,000 startups, scale ups, and grown ups um, employing in, or in total over 15,000 15, uh, people. And our city, our beloved city, Çanakkale. The city of Çanakkale lies on both sides of Dardanelles, which connects the Sea of Marmara to the agency. Its shores touch both European and Asia. It is also long suspension bridge being constructed at the moment, scheduled to be opened in 2093. The population of the city exists 540,000. One of the most important dynamics of the city, which has young population, it is its university. It has the number of students corresponding to 10% of the population. This increased the importance of the region in terms of economy and startups. And let's talk about Çanakkale Techno Park. After ongoing, after going over the general station of Turkey and Çanakkale, I would like to tell you a bit about Çanakkale Techno Park and what's going on in our Techno Park. We are uh, provide services with co-working spaces, laboratories, offices, conference halls, and meeting rooms. And uh, total, total of 146 projects have been implanted uh, within our organization. All these 82 have been completed and 64 are still active. In the transformation of scientific knowledge into technology. In this context, our Technopark supports our companies to carry out uh, joint projects with the university, intellectual property management and technology transfer uh, processes. We provide training, consulting, mentoring and strategy development for technology based companies to prepare its products services for scale uh, for sale to uh, increase uh, existing capacity capacities of those that make sales to provide access to global market and to enter into such suitable uh, partnerships with potential investors. We have some modules about technology transfer offices, awareness, promotion, information, support programs, management, project development and management service services, incorporation and entrepreneurship service services like that. And our digital content development center, we named it Enterhall. One of the most important projects of Chanakala Techno Park is about to come to life. With this project, the, it is aimed to become a point where the game, animation, cartoon ecosystems come together with great speed, primarily in Turkey and later in the international area. And uh, the importance of this project has increased tremendously, especially in the gaming industry with the recent breakout of Turkey. After the successful sales deals of Peak and Rolik in 2020, dynamism, dynamism in the gaming industry has continued. From January, January through March, 15 gaming ventures broke records after receiving an investment worth around $60 million. Dream Games, which ranked second after Getters, uh, in the first quarter, received the largest investment in a single round with $50 million. Again, Brew Games was among the other gaming startups that received the high amount of the investment at the seed stage. Before I finish my presentation, I would like to share with you a few pictures from Enterhall, our digital content center. You can see our uh, are some pictures about our uh, enter hall and thank you very much for listening and Turkey proves to be an excellent source of affordable talented developers a strong market for testing product market fit and ever maturing startup ecosystem we truly believe the in the success of Turkey as a hub for startups and successful exists thank you for listening it would be pleasure for us to host all you in our magnificent city Çanakkale and Turkey thank you very much dear Mr chairman and member of the board ladies and gentlemen my name is Phan Thien Sơn from Danang High Tech Park Danang 
he in the small city in the middle of Vietnam. I would like to thank all of you to give me a chance to introduce our mission today. Vietnam has made numerous significant advances in the promotion and access of foreign investment. Up to now, Vietnam has accessed FDI capital from 141 countries and ter ter territorial with more than 34,000 projects totaling uh, over 400 billion US dollars in registered investment capital with South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong being the last investor in Vietnam. Vietnam is the leading South Asian destination in terms of FDI attraction, stable export ground, strong domestic demand, and a strong external position. Despite the effect of COVID-19 pandemic, Vietnam with its competitive advantages remain a prime spot for foreign business interested in investing and doing business in the supply global chain in the medium and long term. Firstly, preparing clean land for sale to investors. Until now, Vietnam has industrial zone planning network has total of 562 industrial packs with a total planning area of 122,000 hectares, of which 394 industrial packs with a total area of 91,000 hectares have been licensed or established in Edison. Vietnam has 18 economic zones covered and an area of 858,000 hectares. Secondly, the government of Vietnam has many cooperation programs for human resource training between university, college, vocational school, vocational training center, and enterprise directly employer to improve the quality of training and develop human resource in accordance with the requirements and needs of the recruiting enterprise. Regarding investment policy and incentive, the government of Vietnam has also added special incentive under the investment law. Tax rates of 5% for up to 37.5 years, up to six years of exemption and maximum reduction of 50 years for projects of innovation center, R&D center, and project in industry with special investment incentive. Furthermore, the Vietnam government has formed special working group to arrest the difficulty and problem encountered in investor and FBI enterprise operating and manufacturing in Vietnam. In terms of Da Nang City, one of Vietnam's five largest city, you know at the socio-economic center and grow nucleus of the central key economic zone and the central highland with a population of more than 1.2 million people with the labor force accounting for more than half of them. The city GDP is expected to more than 4.37 billion US dollars in 2020 with a per capita income of nearly 4,000 US dollars, which is higher than the national average. Da Nang has emerged as a promising destination of international investment and business in recent years. Regarding investment attraction, the city had attracted 905 FDI projects with a total register investment capital for 3.9 billion US dollars with the following advantage and strength. Firstly, the period 2016 and 2020, it marked 
at the milestone for the Nang City when successfully hosting the APEC Summit Week 2017. This is an important international event, making a new step for the city in promoting its image to the world. The city had organized a number of major, major events, such as investment forum, dialogue, business meeting, and the release of project and policy to introduce potential advantages and investment opportunities, as well as to remove obstacles and issues for business. The affordable needs activity and direction demonstrate the entire policy system keen interest in attracting investment. Secondly, the Nang City had an equine business and investment and environment. The Nang has an effective, unfilled, and transparent administrative management system and its affiliate agencies have ongoing well implemented and directions and policy of the city people committee. This is one of the advantages of Da Nang compared to many other localities in Vietnam. Firstly, Da Nang city is an environmental city with an ideal living and environmental, low level of air and noise pollution and convenient transportation. Da Nang has been honored as domestic and international award such as Environmental Sustainable City of Asian Country in 2011, Asian Landscape City in 2013, City of Excellence in Transport Transformation Award Vietnam and Environment 2015, National Green City 2018, and so on. The four young population structure com complete education and training system well sent human resources, such knowledge and model information technology infrastructure. The city has a service industry in which tourists need a main focus leading to the strong development and financial and banking industry in the city. According to the State Bank of Vietnam, the Nang brand statistic, the anti-city current has 61 bank branches and 249 transaction officers and transaction points, creating favorable conditions in the world of removing difficulties for business. Recently, the Vietnam government approves a project to turn Da Nang into a regional financial center. According to Da Nang construction and development orientation to 2030, with a vision to 2045. High tech industry is one of the city breakthrough fields of social economic development. Until now, the Da Nang High Tech Park, Concentrate Information Technology Park, and Da Nang Industrial Park have attracted 503 projects, including 373 domestic projects and 130 API projects with a total investment capita of nearly 3 billion US dollar. Da Nang High Tech Park established in 2010 is the only high tech park in the central highland and one of the country three high tech park with the goal of building and develop a rice urban area. Internationally, competitive, creation, science, and technology. The Nang High Tech Park cover an area of more than 1,128 1, hectares with six functional subdivisions totaling 612 hectares. Priority to given to request investment in the flowing business field, information technology, communication, computer software, new material technology, nanotechnology, new energy, automation and precision mechanics, and environmental technology, microelectronic, mechanotic, and particular biotechnology, service fuel, 
Đà Nẵng High Tech Park has so far attracted 24% totaling more than 815 million US dollar in registered investment capital. Đà Nẵng High Tech Park has many advantages in attracting investment. Firstly, in terms of geography location, the High Tech Park is located in the highway connecting key economic zone in the central region, such as Trân Mây, Thừa Thiên Huế, Chu Lai, Quảng Nam, Dung Quất, Quảng Nam, and Dung Cất, Quảng Ngãi, has a convenient location in terms of air, waterway, road, and railway. Secondly, the technical infrastructure of the Nang Hai Tech Park is ready to serve the production needs of investors, the power supply system, water plant, and wastewater treatment has been uh, built completely. In general, Da Nang Hai Tech Park has an eco-friendly ecosystem with many trees facilitate the construction of the surrounding landscape. In particular, investment projects in Da Nang Hai Tech Park enjoy preferential policy and outstanding investment support regarding corporate income tax Investors are anticipated to the 10% tax rate for the first 70 years. A 10% tax rate for large projects is setting 130 million US dollars for the next 30 years. Tax exemption for the first four years and a 50% reduction in tax payable for the next nine years. The exemption for land rent incentive during the construction period shall not be set three years from the day of issue run of the land lease decision. Dear business and investor attending the event. Developing high-tech industry in San Formation then into a national startup and innovation center, as well as a real science and technology urban area of international standing and high competitive needs is central to the city development strategy. The city government, as well as the Manor government, both of Da Nang High Tech Park and Industrial Park, are committed to providing on favorable conditions for investors to establish and implement effectively projects in Da Nang, thereby contribute to the city social economic development. We hope to welcome you soon to survey in the city so that you can directly feel the city development potential as well at its highly competitive advantage. Finally, I wish you good health and more successfully in life. Thank you very much. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Maman Abdurrahman from Bandung Technopark, Telkom University, Indonesia. In this session, I would like to present about Indonesian small medium enterprises sustainability facing the global pandemic in Indonesia. The condition of SMEs in Indonesia, as we know, Indonesia is a big country with huge number of SME. And based on the data from Central Bureau of Statistics, this is one department under Indonesian Republic government. It records there are at least we have 64 million SMEs in Indonesia. And SMEs in Indonesia exploded after the ASEAN monetary crisis, as we know, in 1997. Yeah, when many large companies close and fail. And then the people had to survive by trading anything. So that uh, small and medium enterprises are one of the solutions for them to face that conditions. And how about the current condition of small medium enterprises in Indonesia? 
Okay, based on the data, we see that the penetration of information technology throughout the country further strengthens these conditions. So uh, there is the effect of the technology penetrations in uh, Indonesia. Yeah. At least we have 3.7 million SMEs currently run online businesses. Indonesian SME has succeeded in utilizing information technology, particularly social media, in generating a strong new media-based economy. The situation supported by techno-capitalists in the field of telecommunication network providers and the market, which is dominated by domestic startups. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, and then how the effect of global pandemic COVID-19 in Indonesia to our small medium enterprises. Uh, COVID-19 has caused fundamental change in the business environment and prompts businesses at various levels to make mitigations, measures to survive in these suddenly changing situations. Many large labor intensive companies have also failed to cope with the pandemic, resulting in massive unemployment. So the unemployment people, yeah, uh, some former employees then take advantage of separate pay and government assistance to build you know, small medium enterprises. So as an effect of uh, this COVID-19 pandemics, there are massive unemployment and then uh, the government has a strategy to give severance pay and government assistance so the people uh, build new small medium enterprises so the next questions uh, regarding the effect of global pandemic in indonesia no when the covid 19 pandemic hits the question arises is whether Indonesian small medium enterprises will survive or collapse. Okay, of course, if it's all about quantity, logically this will trigger more uh, small medium enterprises as an effect of unemployment uh, of the people. But then existing uh, small medium enterprises and especially the new ones are at risk of being destroyed by the impact of the pandemic. Social distancing or restrictions on activities outside the home, for example, will greatly reduce the number of customers of the small medium enterprises. So the small medium enterprises need to survive in these conditions. One of the strategy of Indonesian government is uh, to vaccinate uh, almost the people in Indonesia. So the acceleration of vaccination is also encouraged to restore the confidence in public consumptions, including for employees and SMEs throughout Indonesia. Vaccination have been and will be given free of charge to achieve herd immunity from more than 180 million people in Indonesia. So uh, another Indonesian uh, government strategy is uh, what we call as National Economic Recovery Program. Of the total budget of more than uh, 699 trillion rupees on May 2021, the realization of the National Economic Recovery Program has reached uh, more than 170 trillion rupees. So the problem faced today is the lack of integration of existing small medium enterprises data. This is uh, our problem. In addition, the SME support scheme through interest uh, subsidies for people's businesses loans also needs more attention, yeah, considering that there are still many SMEs 
that are still untouched by banking services. Ladies and gentlemen, we see that world economic growth currently based on this uh, figure, the global economy is starting to recover and is expected to grow positively in 2021. After the soft contractions in Q2 2020, the first pandemic in Indonesia especially. So the positive trends and economic recovery since Q3 2020 have occurred globally, including in Indonesia. So this is the uh, positive information for us. In such uh, situations, uh, the SME sectors need special attention from the governments because as we know that uh, SME is the largest contributor to GDP in Indonesia and can become a mainstay in the absorption of uh, labor after uh, unemployment. Indonesia's uh, small medium enterprises resilience is one uh, fact. Yeah. The concept of resilience has been used to describe the process of recovery and transformations in small medium enterprises. There are those uh, that SMEs are resilient in the pandemic, given that uh, these companies are very sensitive to environmental disturbance. The resilience of SMEs can be detected by the optimistic attitudes they have under this environmental disturbance. Optimism is known as an indicator of resilience. Therefore, if we can detect a lot of optimism in the SME population, we can conclude that SMEs are generally resilient under the COVID-19 disruptions. Ladies and gentlemen, we face the new normal business uh, characteristic currently. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has changed uh, customer uh, behavior, which business actors need to anticipate due to activity restrictions. Uh, consumers do more activities at home by utilizing digital technology. Meanwhile, the changing industrial landscape and the new competitions map are marked by four business characteristics. At least we have uh, four new characteristics, uh, low mobility and then uh, low touch, uh, hygiene and less crowds. Companies that are successful in the pandemic era are companies that can adapt to these four characteristics. That's why business actors, including SMEs, need to innovate in producing goods and services in accordance with market needs. They can also develop various new business ideas that can also contribute to solving the socioeconomic problems of the community due to the impact of the pandemic. This is what we call a social entrepreneurship. And what kind of strategies of SMEs uh, in the industrial sectors in response to COVID-19? We see at least we have uh, two, three uh, SME strategies to face these conditions. SMEs with high ICT maturity could accelerate digital transformation uh, directly. In addition to, there are many SMEs with low maturity, but experiencing liquidity problems. This kind of SMEs only digitize the marketing functions, the current uh, marketing functions. And the last, we see there are many SMEs with very low digital literacy, but high social capital, yeah. so. This kind of SME will seek to find partners who have satisfactory, satisfactory digital capabilities. And then uh, about the SME sustainability, yeah. are SMEs in Indonesia resistant to COVID-19 or not? Okay. 
based on the data from uh, BPS, on 25,000, more than 25,000 SMEs in Indonesia shows that there is a great optimism from at least half of SMEs in Indonesia. This uh, indicating that the answer is yes, SMEs in Indonesia could uh, resist to COVID-19 uh, pandemic impact. The concept of resilience has been used to describe the process of recovery and transformation in SMEs. This resilience seems to be related to external factors, especially the political in Indonesia, economic, uh, social, and technological factors. Uh, these external factors are uh, contingent, contingencies that come from external parties, not from within the SMEs themselves. These entrepreneurs uh, have the desire to develop without having uh, sufficient capital uh, for it. This uh, courage seems to have uh, cultural roots given the high resilience of Indonesian people due to the long-standing maritime geography and the risk of large and hunting natural disasters. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Bandung Technopark role. Yeah, Bandung Technopark is a science technology park located in Telkom Education Area in Bandung, West Java, Indonesia. PTP serves as an intermediary and synergy builder among academics, uh, business, governments, uh, community, media, and finance institutions. And then uh, another role, uh, Bandung Technopark also supports startups who want to develop their innovative uh, product in ICT. So uh, ASPA is one our partner as a community part partner. And then uh, also we have uh, more than uh, 12 partner uh, academic and more than 58 uh, partner uh, in business. And also Bandung Tehnopak supported by Indonesian government, especially uh, the industrial uh, ministry and uh, we have also collaboration with uh, media and uh, finance institutions. Uh, as a startup incubator, BTP currently incubates more than 60 startups, mostly in ICT fields. Incubation process needs uh, one to three years maximum. So yeah. BTP had incubated more than 20 startups yeah, that currently some of them become a sustained uh, company. This is uh, the list of our current uh, startup uh, incubator teams. Uh, like we have uh, Garputala, uh, Rainbows, uh, Aruna, Smes, uh, Social Kester and Sons. Uh, how about the Bandung Technopark role in facing the pandemic? So Bandung Technopark contributes on overcoming the issue of SMEs. Among them are product development and startup to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic such as we have autonomous UVC mobile robots and then touchless hand walls. Yeah. And in software field, we have virtual expo, learning management systems, training management software, reseller management application for uh, small, medium enterprises. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for kind attention. Ladies and gentlemen, good day. My name is Chin Yi Chen. 
Deputy Director of Southern Taiwan Science Park Bureau. On behalf of the Bureau, I'm pleased to be invited to provide information about STSP today. My topic is Southern Taiwan Science Park, the driving force to spur economic developments. Contents. There are four points of my presentation, such as first growth in STSP, boost science park momentum, establish friendly environments, and finally the inclusion future prospect. Location of STSP. Taiwan is a, at a pivotal location in Asia Pacific area. Therefore, it has strong economic competency. There are three science park bureaus under Ministry of Science and Technology in Taiwan, such as Xinzhu Science Park Bureau, Central Taiwan Science Park Bureau, and Southern Taiwan Science Park Bureau. The Southern Taiwan Science Park consists of two campuses, Tainan Campus and the Kaohsiung Campus. STSP land mass total is 1,610 hectares. The current occupancy rate has reached 95% and is still rising. To meet the need, there are expansion plans going on, such as Chowtou Campus in Kaohsiung City. Jai Campus in Jai County and Pindong Campus in Pindong County. Comprehensive Service Programs The establishment of science parks is to develop a high quality environment for R&D on top surface, incentives, supports, such infrastructure, living, education, social activities, talent, training, and startup facilities. To attract high tech talents and to develop advanced technologies. As a result, lots of companies have come and thrived in the SDSP. For the past two decades, our turnover has been increasing. This year, we reached about 847.7 million new Taiwan dollars. The turnover increased by 14%, which was driven by vigorous demands of five generation and high performance computing. The installation of advanced process plants has driven the overall employment and the development in the surrounding area. So, we expect the figure to reach 1 trillion new Taiwan dollars within two years. Moreover, to increase 2,000 job opportunities each year.
economic contribution. In 2020, the turnover of the STSP accounts for 77% of the total output value of manufacturer industry and 25% of the total employment in Tainan. The turnover of the STSP accounts for 4.3% of the GDP in Taiwan. Industries and employees. There are 246 companies in the science park and 43 are foreign companies. Industrial clusters include IC, precision machinery, telecommunication, optical electronics, biotechnology, computer peripheral, and others. Meanwhile, more than 81,000 of employees are working in the science park. International leading tenant companies. Many international leading companies have set up operations in the science park, including TSMC, Merck, Applied Material, ASML, Kony, 3M, Alvec, and the tail, and so on. Strengthen industrial clusters. To sharpen current industrial developments and boost the momentum of the science park, such as IC, biotech, and precision machinery, solid foundation. We emphasize interdisciplinary applications, not only in technology exchanges, but also in talent cultivation to step into the promotion of precision health, smart manufacturing, AIoT, and the fifth generation industries. Innovation ecosystem. An innovation ecosystem is crucial to enlarge science park momentum. We have set up a platform to link up several resources for science industries. A computer service program is designed and carried out, including resources for R&D and tenant cultivation, assistance to startups, accelerator for entering markets, and so on. Ecology. We not only focus on industry development, but also make a balance with environmental protection. We harmonize with environment both Taiwan and the Kaohsiung Science Park are diamond red eco communities certified by EEWH in Taiwan. And there are 16 diamond red green building altogether. There are 216,000 trees in the science park. 
We also encourage recycling and uh, reuse it to establish a circular economy science park, such as reclaimed water and the water waste reuse. Employees to take care of our employees, we emphasize workplace safety and equality. We reassure and award our employees. In addition, we take care of our employees' children. A new children caring center has opened in the science park. Sound living amenities. We provide sound living amenities for all aspects of life, including dormitories, life hub, 7 Eleven convenience stores and the Starbucks coffee shops, wellness center, and the sports park, clinics, and the bilingual schools. Especially, the National Lanka International Experimental High School, including elementary, junior high, senior high, and the bilingual departments. Public art works. We also want our science park to be more than just science and technology. So we add in elements of art and culture. We have set up more than 20 pieces of public artworks, allowing our employees to search for fun in daily life and create surprises in technology. Fifth of technological and economic growth, we have received Worth for results from current strategy. So, we will duplicate the success and move forward by linking up for synergies in the future. We hope to connect our campuses from northern Jiayi County to southern as Tainan City, Kaohsiung City, and the Pindong County with Southern Smart Green Energy City via major transportation networks such as the National Super Highways and the High Speed Rail to form a high tech industrial corridor to respond to local needs upgrade local industries, leverage resources, and extend the effects of each parks and let current industries into a new era. Finally, I will show you a short video for you to better understand the current situation of Southern Taiwan Science Park. Thanks of my briefing today. Thank you for your attention.
Hello everyone, my name is Mungpai, Foreign Relations Officer of National Information Technology Park of Mongolia. First of all, I have to inform one thing. Actually, this speech was supposed to be made by our director, Mr. Tsukhtkir, but due to the health issue, he is now unable to make a speech. So I'm going to present instead of my director, Business Environment in Mongolia. The content consists of major three items, improvement in business environment, ecosystem on startups, and ITP introduction. Overview of Mongolia. Mongolia is the country with a land area of about 1.6 million square meter and has a population of about 3.35 million, is the world's most sparsely populated country, 69% of total, 2.3 million people live in Ulaanbaatar. Majority of the population are Buddhist. Our country is sparsely populated and has a harsh climate between plus minus 45 degrees of Celsius. It is a landlocked country bordering two powerful countries, Russia and China. GDP per capita is 4,000 US dollar, and research and development expenditures are equal to 0.1% of GDP. Politics of Mongolia takes place in a framework of semi-presidential, multi-party, representative democracy. Executive power is exercised by the prime minister, who is the head of government and the cabinet. The advantages of Mongolia. As I mentioned in my previous slides, we have large territory, small population, which is the most attractive point. Secondly, our country is rich in the minor resources, such as copper, molybdenum, gold, coal, and gas. There are 80 kinds of minor resources and about 60,000 mining deposits in Mongolia. Another major industry is the animal husbandry, that Mongolia has approximately 67 million live stocks. We also produces, produce Kashmir products, positioned in second place as exporter. Disadvantages of Mongolia. 
For the disadvantages of Mongolia, I would like to point out about low population, only 3.3 million, which results in a small market. And the second one is extreme climate, which is in the summertime 45 degrees, and in the wintertime minus 45 degrees. And the last point is we don't have any sea border, landlocked country between two big powers, Russia and China. International indexes. Forbes determined the best countries for business by rating 161 nations on 15 different factors, property rights, innovation, taxes, technology, corruption, inf infrastructure, market size, political risk, quality of life, workforce, freedom, red tape, and investor protection. Mongolia is ranked in 86th from 161 countries. By doc documenting changes in regulation in 12 areas of business activity in 19 economies, the doing business analyzes regulation that encourages efficiency and supports freedom to do business. Mongolia is ranked in 81st from 190 countries from the doing business analysis in 2020. In Mongolia, there are two institutions who provide the information on business environment for the foreign companies and investors interested in doing business in Mongolia. One is the National Development Agency, to be newly established by the government after the general election in 2016. The other one is the Mongolian National Chamber of Commerce and Industry representing the private business. This uh, slide shows the detailed information of the handbooks, which published by above mentioned two organizations. You can see detailed information from the respective columns for each organization. Those related to the business. Main laws related to the business are including company law, loan on loan investment, law on corporate registration, law on tax, accounting law, law on law related to labor, law on intellectual property right, law on arbitration, bankruptcy law, law on SME. You can see brief description of the respective law on this slide. Tax system. Tax system in Mongolia was established based on market economy in 1992. At the time of transition from socialism to capitalism. Since then, the government has been making an effort to continuously improve the tax system in order to fulfill the government public commitment, such as the reduction of tax burden for the company, making a job creation, the decrease of informal informal economy, the expansion of foreign direct invest, investment, and the development of SME. We have 10 national taxes and 12 locals. Law on corporate income tax was adopted on June 2006. The corporations subject to paying income tax are a company to be established based on Mongolian law, a foreign company which the head office located in Mongolia and the non-resident foreign company has sales amount about 33% in the territory of Mongolia or operating representative office in Mongolia. The government launched the telecommunications reform program in the mid-1990s, establishing an independent regulator and partially privatizing the fixed line operator, Mongolia Telecom Company. Public access internet centers were established from 1998, but usage was low because of the high cost. Home use was also expensive with email access, costing MNT 15,000 and internet MNT 75,000 in 1999, when average monthly salary was about only 30,000 MNT. 
Mobile phone usage grew rapidly in the decade after from 1995 in a competitive environment and e-banking and e-commerce started to catch on from around 2000 years. In 2005, the government introduced the One Home, One PC program, providing computers to households for about $250 a unit. By 2009, over half of households had laptops. With support from World Bank, communications and infrastructure development project all of the countries, 30, 335 districts, which is called Sons in Mongolia, were by 2011, provided with access to mobile voice services and in many cases to medium speed internet. Mobicom launched the first mobile broadband network in 2009. In the same year, MCS Electronics started a fiber to the building project for broadband connection to all major buildings in Ulaanbaatar. Mobile phone usage is very high, with more accounts than people, and 80% of the population is connected for the internet. A peculiarity of internet used in Mongolia is that much e-commerce is done through Facebook, especially transactions between small enterprises. Strength in the Mongolian business environment. There are 80 kinds of mining resources and about 6,000 6, mining deposits and 80% of national land areas, farmland and pasture. Emerging market Mongolia is a relatively new market, low competition. It is possible to acquire the business chances in many ways, relatively unrestricted investment environment, and corporate income tax rate is low in case of SMEs. The law on innovation with seven chapters, 30 clauses, 106 articles, and 193 sub-articles had been approved by the Parliament on May 22nd in 2012 and took into force since 5th of July in 2012. Common major issues on startups. This slide shows the statistical data in what field startups have the issues from the viewpoint of internal environment of business, the issues consist of product and service quality, 2.2%, from knowledge and competency of business owners, 7.7%, planning, 5.5%, human resource, 11%, financing, 12%, and other issues, 14.2%. Issues related with the ecosystems are social infrastructure and cooperation has 19.7%, governmental matter and legal environment issues 15.7%, users and customers 5.5%, and others 6.5%. Startup ecosystem map. In Mongolia, startups ecosystem mainly consists of corporate, capital, entrepreneur, community, media, co-working, education, incubator, and accelerator. By the way, NITP has been working on incubating activities for 18 years. NITP introduction. On this slide, I would like to introduce about our park a little. The information National Information Technology Park was established in 2002 by the government of Mongolia. The establishment of NITP was implemented with the grant aid of 1 million USD from the government of the Republic of Korea. Organization structure. Our park's definition is a state-owned self-financing body. We do our operation under administration of communications and information technology 
Authority of Mongolia. We have three departments, Administration and Human Resource, Project Management, Training and Marketing, and last one is Last one is innovation and technology department. The last one is actually responsible for incubating activities. Main function. We have four main activities, incubation, IT hub library, exam and training on IT field, and last one is research and project. Companies at the incubator. At the moment, we have more than 20 startups and companies at our incubator, and most of them are specialized in information technology field. At the end of my presentation, I would like to introduce one of our startups, same company, and their ongoing project. This uh, as the roadmap of the same company, they have a lot of projects to implement in future, such as IT-based payment system, bionic arm, robotic systems, so on. This slide shows one of same project called bionic arm, helping disabled children to provide equal right to the children study and live independently and to promote social participation regardless how they're disabled. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you, ASPA, SPI, Secretariat staffs for organizing and successfully implementing this forum. I wish good luck and success to all of you. Hope SPIF will be great chance to expand businesses and find out new idea for all Mongolian and Asian entrepreneurs. Thank you. Assalamu and greetings from Pakistan. It's an honor and privilege to be part of the SPIF 2021. Uh, this is a topic very close to my heart, so I am privileged to be part of this panel and to be able to share my thoughts on this very, very important topic. Before I start, let me introduce myself. I am Dr. Rizwan Riaz, the Vice President of the National Science and Technology Park, Pakistan, and the Pro-Rector for Research, Innovation and Commercialization at the National University of Sciences and Technology, which is the top university of the country. I've been very fortunate to have experienced three distinct education systems and their associated research uh, of the world during, during my degrees. And in the past 10 to 12 years, I've been very focused and lucky to have been part of many projects where industry and academia linkage was the focus. And while my current seat also is uh, totally related to this topic. So as I said, something very close to my heart. Asia is on track to take on more than 50% of the global GDP by the near future and literally drive 40% of the world's consumption, probably even more very soon, uh, representing a real shift in the center of gravity of the world when we're talking of economies and when we're talking of consumption. So there's a huge opportunity to be tapped into. But Asia is actually two Asias. The East Asia, which is the progressive booming part, and the South Asia, which I am part of, where the development is more of a potential and we see the potential in terms of the, uh, the boom that should be coming very soon. Before I get into all these numbers, let me apologize with these recorded messages. Of course, I can't be sure if somebody else has already spoken these. So bear with me, maybe it's a bit of a repetition, but I'll get into the local stuff very soon and that'll be fresh. So even today, the quarter of the world's GDP is contributed by Asia alone and the rapid urbanization in the last two decades, especially in the Eastern Asian countries, is contributing aggressively to the consumer demand and the economic growth. The reduced infant mortality rates, of course, means more younger population coming into the consumer market, as well as the innovation market as the youngest bright minds. And the stark difference between the East and South, while we look at it as maybe a hindrance, 
is actually creating a very competitive environment where we get seeing a lot of innovation happening in the southern Asian countries just because of this competition. Because of this, because of this today, Asia is home to one third of the global unicorns and this ratio is increasing in favor of Asia very rapidly. There have been lots of studies defining why Asia will dominate, how Asia is dominating, what are the factors uh, which are contributing to this dominance. Some of them are listed here. And of course, most of you are familiar with these, so I will not go into details of these. But what I, I will focus on is the digital, digital innovation or the digital drive these days in these Asian countries, around the world actually, but definitely in Asia, uh, which is led by China, Japan, obviously these East Asian countries, but is one of those areas where the South Asia countries are also doing very well and is one of the areas where the development in these, uh, these countries is not hindered by economic conditions. So the world is watching and therefore the VC financing, the venture capital financing in Asia has been rising rapidly except for this uh, area of the pandemic and the sanctions imposed by the US on China, uh, there was a slight dip, which is again seeing the rise, but we can see the potential and the world can see the potential, which is why all this venture capital financing is coming here. In quarter one of 2021 alone, the exit value in Asia of the top 100 surged to $148 billion when we compare this to $1 billion in 2013. So you can see how the exponential rise is going. And this again, number is going us tremendously fast. So bringing this more local to me, Pakistani startup ecosystems also booming, just like the other Asian countries, and especially in the digital areas, Pakistan expects to be a major player in the Asian region when it comes to startup and knowledge economy. Some of the macro indicators which point towards this success or the point towards this boom are that we are a populous country, 220, uh, 220 million people, sixth populous country of the world with a median age of 23. So it's a very, very young country, which means more innovative minds, more people ready to take risks and therefore more uh, people hopefully likely to succeed. 80% of the GDP in Pakistan goes towards household consumption, which means it's a consumer market and therefore there's a vacuum for a lot of ideas and companies to come forward. The Pakistani middle class is growing rapidly and since this is the class which is a consumer and developer both, this is where the potential is. Because of this, startups have been getting increasing, increased access to funding from different channels, including international. The audience is becoming larger every day. Uh, there are multiple factors like sub, sub, uh, cellular subscriptions, uh, 5G, 4G, uh, broadband, whatever. But the main theme is that these youngsters are using and leveraging this mobile technology, the internet, the digital technologies, and getting access to funding for their ideas. There's a lot of skilled people, so therefore, all these youngsters that I keep talking about, well, there are about 300,000 of them coming out of, every, uh, out of the universities every year. Another 300,000 coming out of vocational trainings with the skills needed by today's industry. And a lot of them are software developers. So a lot of people very well uh, trained. So why are we so far behind? Well, that's because in 2005, there was only one incubation center established at NAST, uh, which was doing incubation in all fields of science. There were a few IT incubators, but only one science and tech incubator, and that was in NAST. In 2012, this started to go up slightly. And today we have more than 700 startups and more than 25 incubators. And this number of incubators is uh, rising very, very rapidly in Pakistan. So we are seeing a trend where these youngsters are coming forward with their ideas and the government and the universities and the academia is finding ways to support them. However, with all of that, there was no science and technology part. There was no ecosystem where we could put these startups right next to accomplished companies, right next to mentors in an area where they would learn from experience of others. For this, NUST, 
the National University of Sciences and Technology stepped forward and created the first science and technology park, the NSTP, in 2019 on our own campus, bringing you an ecosystem very unique. Of course, this exists globally, but not in Pakistan, where you have the top university of the country with the industry uh, sitting in between and the startup sitting in the same building, learning from both and leveraging the capabilities of both. The science and technology park that we have created uh, is a small park. It's uh, only 110,000 square feet right now, but it, there is an expansion space of uh, a few, uh, uh, almost 100 acres available to us. The park that we have designed has some anchor tenants, some high-tech SMEs, and then a lot of startups, as I said, in the same building. We have given them networking spaces, cafeterias, places to mingle, and then there's a, a regimented program where the accomplished companies, the larger companies, mentor the startups, and then, of course, are able to invest or buy out these companies. What we have done is we've created an ecosystem where there are eight thematic areas, and all, we have basically tried to fit in any idea that can come up in, out of a university into these. This park is open to anybody, not only for NUST graduates, but anybody from Pakistan can come in here and open a startup or any company from anywhere in the world can come here and open an office. So an excellent location in Islamabad, uh, the capital city of Pakistan, and therefore, uh, and in the top university of the country. So I think about the best place you can put a park. Because of initiatives like this, the venture capital funding in Pakistan is growing very rapidly and our park is attracting a lot bulk of it. If you look at the, these numbers, you can see the rise in the past couple of years. And in fact, in just the last year, the total amount of funding we've ever had, 50% of it we got in just the last year. So you can see the interest that is being developed and a lot of this investment is coming from outside Pakistan. So people from outside the country are waking up to the potential and reaching out. This has a lot to do with the science and technology park and the incubation center at universities, but like one at NAST. So let me first introduce uh, the National University of Sciences and Technology in terms of the ecosystem that we are giving for this innovation uh, culture. The university is unique in the, the, the focus on research that we have and some of the key labs that we have, which are unique in the country, and in some cases, unique in the region. So with that, we are able to focus on very cutting edge research and our students and faculty get to publish and do collaborative research with the top universities and top institutions of the world. Going along with this theme, recently NAS established the first interdisciplinary research cluster uh, of the country. Uh, called NISH, the NAST Interdisciplinary Cluster for Higher Education. Uh, this is a, a brand new idea where what we have done is brought together 22 of the best labs of NAST, which means also the best researchers of NAST in one building and place them at literally walking distance from the science and technology park. So the idea is the science and technology park is where the people with ideas are doing the entrepreneurship, but they're going to need access to the R&D capability of the university. So rather than having them to go to the different schools and different labs all over the campus, bring those facilities right next to them. It gives them access to this thing and gives the university access to the industry, creating that famous industry academia linkage which we've all been striving for for so many years. Another venture that NAST has uh, ventured into is the Innovative Healthcare Technologies, the first facility in Pakistan for the manufacturing of catheters and cardiac uh, angioplasty balloons. It's obviously an ISO certified facility and has recently secured uh, the licensing from the drug regulatory authority body of the country. So we are well on our way to becoming a, a manufacturer and hopefully an exporter of cardiac stents. So coming back to the topic at hand, what NAST has been doing even before the science and technology part is establishing a system for a system and an ecosystem for entrepreneurship, which includes two things, a, a compulsory entrepreneurship course for all our students and an incubation mentoring and training center at NAST, which we call Tech One. Tech One has a six month program where our youngsters from the university or from outside 
can come in and get free training, mentoring, and help in registering, registering their companies, et cetera, uh, for, uh, for whatever idea they have or whatever fields they want to. And then after that, they, for another two years, they get highly subsidized space in the science and technology park so that they can sit with real companies, really grown companies, and grow their own ideas into profitable ventures. So let me close this whole loop. The, industry, the science and technology part, part, being part of the university is the perfect ecosystem to drive the knowledge economy and the innovation economy of a country, for example, Pakistan as here. And then these countries will drive the economy of Asia. And when the South and East combine in their strengths, this, uh, this strength and this boom will, in my opinion, be much, much higher than what we are seeing even today. So let me close with that. And I look forward to your feedback and uh, your comments and even ideas for our science and technology mark. My information, contact information is on the slide. Uh, and I would love to hear from you. And I would love to invite anybody who's listening to come to Pakistan, come to Islamabad, see the science and technology park, see the university and talk to us so that we can do better for our students and better for our countries. Thank you very much.